I mean, what's the normal way to end a crucifixion? To break the legs. To break the legs. Why do you break the legs? So they can't push up and stay alive. You want them to die quick. And so if you break their legs, they're going to die fast. Now, but that's not what happened to Jesus. This is John uh, chapter 19. I'll just read it. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, bringing out a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, when we look at the body of the man's shroud, we do not find evidence of broken bones, but we do find a neat elliptical wound in his side, which may correspond with our spear. And we see uh, two things, uh, this dark bloody stuff here, and then lighter areas, which may be corresponding to Sarah. Here you see the same thing here. Now, why is this important? This is, this is more special than it may look. The Romans were known to have used four different kinds of spears, and we have examples of those spears today. The Hosta, the Hosta Militaris, the Pilum, and the Lancia. Those were the spears that the Romans used. Now, early on, uh, we, we can actually follow the evolution of Roman weapons. Early on, when, when Julius Caesar made his conquest, the types of spears used were different than what later happened at the time of Christ. When Julius Caesar was making his conquest, the Romans used spears that had long heads and like arrowheads, like every like Greek spears, really. Okay, little arrowheads at the end, and it was like and you could throw them, and then you could if you, if you miss, you could pick it up and use it again. The only problem was the enemy could pick them up and use them again too. And so the Romans would fight these barbarians and throw their spears while the barbarians threw rocks. But then the barbarians picked up Roman spears and started throwing them back. And so the Romans were dying to Roman spears. And so they figured out, hey, you know what? Maybe we need to come up with some disposables. And what they and that's where the hosta, the hosta militaris, and the pylon came in. These became the Roman war spears. And the hosta, the hosta militaris, and the pylon, they, they had tips like ice picks, and they were very thin right where you got to the head. You had this sturdy shaft, and then right here in the head, it got real thin, and then you went to your ice pick. So when you threw that baby, if you got your victim, tip would snap off inside of them, okay? Or if you miss the tip would break off. So they might have a stick, but they don't have a spear. And that's so they're disposable. So when you went into battle as a Roman, you brought in lots of these. You came in with a whole bunch of these spears. And poof, 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 okay, but they were disposable. You get more if you run out, but you don't want them coming back at you, okay? Now, let me just get that out of myself. Here we go. The hosta, the hospital, the tarps, and the pilot, these are your war spears, okay? Disposable. The Lancia, however, was, was one of those types that was not disposable. The Lancia type spear was, and we, again, we have examples of the Lancia spear, and it was like, um, it was like, it had a, a tip like an Indian arrowhead, but it was not thin at the shaft. You could use it over and over again. You didn't throw your Lancia. It was a poking spear. It was a poking spear. So you put that down, it was like a crowd control. All right, you carried that with you, and when things out of hand, you and your buddies, boom, down, okay? That's what you did with the lancy. It wasn't for throwing, it's for poking. Now, what's interesting is this. The Lancia type spear is believed to have been standard issue for the military garrisons for the troops guarding it around Jerusalem, for the Romans in Jerusalem. All right? Now, um, in the Bible, in the Bible, when the when they describe that spear that was thrust into Jesus' side, they couldn't use the generic word for spear because there is such a word. They did not. Guess what word was used? Lancia, lanka, Greek. The Greek word lanka, which is Greek for the Latin word lancia. It specifically describes where the word lance, by the way. Okay. It specifically described the type of spear that was thrust into Jesus' side. Out of all those Roman spears, the only spear that makes an oblong-shaped spear hole of the, with those dimensions is the Lancia type spear. No other Roman spear fits the hole in the, in the man's shroud side. And the dimensions of that of that head fit the fit the dimensions of the head of that Lancia spear. Okay. So again, think about our forgery. If this is a forgery, that's amazing. Now, how do you get blood and water out of a wound? 
Now, that, that's a question there. Now, nobody knows. I mean, there are several possibilities. There's not one way to do this, so I want to be fair. I present only one, so I don't confuse audiences, okay? But I want you to understand, there's more than one way to get it. I, the, the, the theory that I like the best, because it's most direct, okay, is put forth by Dr. Anthony Saba. Uh, Saba's a cardiothoracic surgeon. He noted from his own surgical experiences, as well as from a, a questionnaire he took among other thoracic surgeons, that whenever you get severe violence to the rib cage without an open wound, like if you get beat in the chest, all right, and there isn't a hole anywhere, what happens because of this violence is you get this bloody fluid that accumulates in your pleural cavity. The, pro, the pleural cavity is between your chest wall and your lung, and that fluid builds up in there. Now, what happens then is that as that fluid builds up, Okay, in the pleural cavity, when, when, when things settle down or you die, what happens is that bloody fluid settles into the heavy dark cellular layer below that's very thick and rich and red and a lighter serous fluid above. Okay? Now, what happens if you will poke it in a hole down here between the fifth and sixth ribs? Then what happens is, first of all, the, 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 the thick red cell is going to come glubbing out. All right, the fix up, boom, 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 and then once the, that's all the way done, you get to the lighter serous fluid, and then you're going to be followed by the watery stuff. And so what you would observe is blood, thick, nasty, thick, you know, blood, and then the lighter serous fluid following. And so like John was describing, first blood, then water. That's what you'd see. All right, and then we see the post mortem pooling of the blood. In the back of the shroud, you see the, the, the blood markings gathered in small and black. And that's what would happen. If you took the shroud, uh, took the, the body off of the cross, and you laid them down on this cloth, what's going to happen is that blood is going to ooze from that wound here all the way around and gather in the small and the back. And the pattern is exactly consistent with what we see on the shroud. It's the post mortem pooling of the blood phenomenon is what it's called. So again, another one of those details that our shroud forger had to come in right here. So what would our forger have to have known? He knew about the post-mortem, uh, going from back to front. Uh, they knew about the post-mortem pulling of the blood phenomenon, and put that little detail in there. The proximate dimensions of the lancia-type spear, okay, because it fits. The nail in the hands goes in, in, in the wrist, not the palms. That the nail in the wrist causes the thumb to flip inward, all right? Looks like I can see something here. Oh, you know about the up down the up down angles um, on, on the cross that, that when you die from crucifixion you're moving up and down, and he knew that to change the blood flow uh, coming out of those uh, wrist wounds. He knew that the crown of thorns was a cap of thorns as opposed to a circlet. He knew the dimensions and symmetry of the dumbbell markings caused by the flagrum taxilatum. These are all these are pathological consistencies which are very impressive if indeed this was a forgery. Now, I'm stopping here, but one more thing I do want to add, and I'll talk about this next time, too, because this, it basically kicks this forger in the head. This guy that comes off and says, oh, I got an eye forge, because he's saying that, oh, what well, all you have to do, you see, is you take some, some iron, this, this pigment, this vermilion pigment, and you smear it on the body there, and you put it on, you make it, and voila, and then you add the blood. Okay. Clearly, he knows nothing about the shroud. This guy, he's a, he, made, he made a fool of himself. For people who actually studied the shroud, he made a fool of himself. Because people who have studied the shroud know that John Heller did this experiment way back with, during the Shroud Return Research Project. Very simple test. The question was this. What was on the cross? For, what, what was on the cloth first? The blood or the image? Simple question. The blood or the image? The blood. How do you know that? Because he rose after he blood. Oh, well, yeah, okay, well, yes, yeah. so you're right, if, if it's, you're right, if it's Jesus, you're absolutely right, in, in, in the real, and with, with, in the, in, in the, if it's authentic, then clearly the blood was there first, and then indeed the image came from Jesus raised from the dead, then the image marked. So, yes, now on the shroud, there's an easy way to test for this, okay, but you see the, the image itself, the, I'll talk about this next time, but where you see the body image, what you're looking at is the, 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 the cloth is aged in the shape of the body. You're looking at age cloth. There's no pigment there. This has been studied under the microscope up the wazoo, and I'll show you those pictures next time. There is no pigment. There is no, this stuff where you put this stuff and you bake it, there is no pigment on the cloth. None. It's been looked at. There's nothing there. You can look at it under the microscope. Nothing. What's making the picture? The cloth is aged. Some radiative energy has selectively aged the cloth in the form of this body. No. It's called dehydrative oxidation. Dehydrative acid oxidation resulting in a yellow carbonyl chromophore. That's the chemical process that gives you that body image. Okay? Now, 
what now the thing is is that that image imagine that this this table is the shroud the image is only present on one side it's not on this side it's only on this side you turn it over there's no picture it's very faint it